Resurrection Sunday ought to be our favorite time. I read on Twitter this morning that Max Licato said, if Resurrection Sunday doesn't light your fire, there's something wrong with your Bunsen burner. I thought that was catchy. But beyond catchy, the Lord Jesus Christ has done something for us, and, and, and I'm so grateful for that, and I've been trying to learn how to use social media a little bit more and Twittering things out. It's really hard to get everything down in just a few characters, you know, because I have a lot more to say, I think. But I'm learning to do that. If you'd like to follow, it's at Destin Pastor. And, um, and I try to tweet out there, twit out there, whatever you want to call it, trying to encourage people to come and be a part of what God is doing right here. And today, as we, uh, as we focus on what is, a, what is really, you know, what is it that God wants us to know about Resurrection Sunday, I want us to understand that God has called us all to be on, a, on an epic journey. And as I read through the pages of Scripture, I find a lot of journeys that seem quite epic. Now, many of you came from other places to come here today. Like, who's, who came from the furthest to be here today? Come on, speak out. Nine o'clock was wide awake now. Where'd y'all come from? Michigan? Ohio? Indiana? Alabama. Come on now, that's not far. How many of you, is this your very first time to Destin? Okay, now, were you looking forward to the trip? I'm certain you were. You came and you've discovered our white sugary sands, the beautiful uh, Emerald Coast waters, and, and a great place to, to, to be and play and work and, and eat and do all those kinds of things. And as you began to plan out that journey, you know, you were planning this thing out. This is an epic spring break. This is an epic journey. We're going to be a part of it. When the Lord Jesus Christ had entered through the gateway of glory, he talked about, to his disciples about a lot of different things. And in the Gospel of John, in chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, Jesus uh, talks about this. He says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, but believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. And Thomas, Thomas was always the, the disciple that doubted. And Thomas said this. He said, Lord, we do, not know, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? How do we know the way? How do we know the way that God has for us in life? How do we know the way to get to heaven one day? How do we know the way to have peace in our heart? How do we know the way to, to build strong relationships with our loved ones? How do we know the way for a career path to choose? How do we know the way for so many questions and so many destinations that come at us in life? And then Jesus made this remarkable statement. It's one of the most remarkable statements that you'll ever read. And Jesus said this, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. The Lord Jesus Christ is talking about the roadway to heaven. He's talking about the roadway to glory, the, gro the roadway to the presence of God the Father. And he says, I am that way. And when we discover that Jesus Christ is the way in our life, we discover that he has answers for our life. He has answers for our career. He has answers for our family. He has answers for our finances. He has answers for our difficulties. He meets us all along the way. And so this morning, as we talk about this road that Jesus is talking about, I want you to think about directions. Because, you know, most of us are directionally challenged. So when you uh, got up in Indiana and decided that you were going to come to Destin this morning to, or this weekend for, for vacation, I'm certain you pulled out a map. Or maybe you punched it into your GPS and the GPS told you what to do. Because we are all directionally challenged. We can't just figure it out typically where we're going to go without making a lot of wrong turns. Because we all know what it's like to be lost, right? Have you ever been lost? I mean, there's like three different stages of being lost. Being lost and you, you don't know it. You decided to take that shortcut that some friend told you about, and you turn down that road, and, and, and you don't know you're lost. You think you're fine, but you're really lost. And then it's being lost and, and recognizing it, but there's a problem that comes in right here. You're too proud to admit it. You're not about to turn over to your spouse and say, I think we're lost, right? 
And then you finally get to that place where you're so fed up with your spouse saying, Honey, I think we're lost, that to prove her wrong, you're going to pull over and ask directions. And when you find out, you have to come back to the car and say, We're not lost. We're going to take this scenic detour now to get to our destination. But today I want to ask you a question. The question is a, a very honest question. It's a very real question. Every single one of us needs to give answer to in our life. Am I lost? Not in a physical sense. I mean, we all know where we are right now. We're about as far south as we can go without turning left. Right? So we know where we are physically. But where am I in my life spiritually? Maybe for some of you, this is your very first time in, in coming into these doors, but you've got this gnawing, sick feeling that maybe you're lost, or, or, or maybe, you know, you, uh, you have lost people around you. But today what I want to do is I want to show you a loving God, a God who didn't leave us in our lostness, but His Son came and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. I want to show you that God didn't leave us there because our, of our lostness. He did something. He installed a GPS navigational system into every single one of us, into the framework of human uh, um, history as a spiritual map. But the map that I want to show you is not from Rand McNally. It's from God's Word. And without it, we're destined to destruction. And so it's critical for life. And, and what we find out then is God guides us and He leads us. And so the very first thing that God shows us in this directional system, like when you're pumping it, punching it in on your GPS, it'll ask you several different things. And, and the very first thing that God gives us is He gives us this sense of being aware of atonement. It's what we call atonement awareness. And one of the things that we discover that God uh, places in that directional system is this concept of lostness and this concept of, uh, of lostness being ultimately connected with justice. Somewhere deep in every one of our personas are, are those, uh, those ideas that there must be consequences for immoral behavior. When somebody commits a crime, when some body blatantly violates the law, something within our, within our mentality says somebody's got to pay. And this somebody's got to pay is not just an American thing, it's a worldwide thing. And it's not just a, a 21st century thing, it's gone on throughout all the centuries. It's happened among all people groups and, and throughout all history, among every tribe and culture and people and, and language. And what they've done is they've devised a system that, that makes guilty parties pay for wrongdoings. Now, in some countries they pay with fines and others are thrown into prisons and sometimes they, they pay with their lives. And this common idea of payment is called atonement. So, you know, we are an atonement aware, an atonement conscious kind of people. It runs deep within us. And Webster's Dictionary defines atonement as this, making amends or payment for offenses committed. So understand something. This is a, a uniquely human value. It's not seen in animals. You know, at our house, we have one dog, two cats, and four baby kittens that were born yesterday. And uh, I was outside working in the yard, and my daughter comes out, Dad, come quick. You're not going to believe this, but I became the obstetrician yesterday <laughs> and helped one of those kittens out, you know. Whew! I'm glad I don't do that every day. I love to see these babies, and I'm tickled to see them come in and everything. But, I, you know, that, that's kind of hairy, you know. No pun intended on the, uh, on the kitten deal. Somebody at my house said, I didn't know they came out with hair. But they do. Yeah, it's all there. But it's really cool. But you know, like um, the mama cat, you know, she just can't eat enough right now. She eats her dry food. She eats her canned food. She eats an egg. And, and when the dog gets his food, she goes running to his dish. And when she gets it out of his dish, he doesn't come and say, that cat stole out of my dish. That cat needs to be kicked. They have no idea. They might bite back and say, stay out of my stuff. But they have no idea that anybody has really done them wrong. You see, this value is a uniquely human kind of thing. But we have to ask this question, where do we get this value about atonement? And how did all the tribes and all the cultures throughout all of history come up with the idea that wrongdoing requires a payment of some kind? Now, the evolutional uh, theory people, they've got a very difficult time trying to explain that. 
But I can explain it to you. We are all made in the image of God. In 1 Thessalonians, it says that we have a, a mind and we have a body and we have a spirit. God has made us in that way. Animals don't have a spirit. Plants don't have a spirit or a mind. You know, they just got a body. Animals got a mind and a body. But we've been given a mind and a body and a spirit. With my body, I know the world beneath me, my five senses. With my mind, I know the world around me. But with my spirit, I know God. And, and so that's how I got that. God placed that deep within our makeup. And so this concept of atonement is woven into us. And so when Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, he's talking about this thing called the epic journey. And this epic journey begins with the atonement. You know, when you, you go to the movies or when you rent a DVD, what always happens, you've got all those trailers, all those previews, and what they're doing is they're advertising the things that are to come. When you uh, travel across the United States and you take these big epic journeys, you know, sometimes you th see things advertised for miles and miles and miles. I know coming from uh, uh, Jacksonville to Tallahassee, there's a sign that advertises someplace in Texas, I can't remember the name of it, but it says it's only like 758 more miles. You know, the, the previews of those things that, that are to come. And, and in Genesis, in the very first book of the Bible, God began to give us some previews. In Genesis, the first book of the Bible, God began to tell us there's a scenic overlook coming. Just like the GPS in your car says about these things coming up on the right and the left as you're traveling down the road. These are the things that are coming. And so he gives us these sneak previews of his future presentation uh, of, of this uh, roadmap to the atonement for all of humanity. On one hand, God gave man this really high-risk gift of freedom. And we can understand that as parents when we give a key to our 16-year-old that's never driven the car away from us before, but this night they're going to drive away. They've been given the, the high-risk gift of freedom. What are they going to do? How are they going to handle it? Are they going to arrive alive? Are they going to be okay? There's all this kind of stuff. And, and, and yet, with that freedom that God gave us, just like when we give it to our kids, there came a choice uh, uh, that, that required the high cost of atonement. In other words, our freedom of choice, but His choice, in God giving us the freedom of choice, but in our choice to do wrong, to disobey God, it really costs God an awful lot. And the very first thing we see in God's roadmap, in the very first scenic overview is this, is first blood. First blood. In Genesis, God tells Adam and Eve that rebelling against Him will lead to death. And Adam and Eve ignored what God said. The Genesis account tells us in chapter 2, verse number 17, God speaks, but you must not eat the fruit from the tree which gives the knowledge of good and evil. If you ever eat fruit from that tree, you will die. And so Adam and Eve, they sinned. They directly disobeyed God. And when they did, it, the Bible tells us they tried to hide from God. You go about uh, just a few verses further in chapter 3, verse number 7, and this is what we read. When they ate that fruit, then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized, whoa, we are naked. And so what did they do? So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. You know what they were trying to do? They were trying to cover up what had happened. They were trying to hide it from God. I mean, have you ever tried to hide something? You know, I, a few years ago... I forget exactly what it was, but it was um, something I'd gotten my wife, and I had it hidden in the garage, and she found it and wanted to know what that was for and who it was for. You know, you try to hide things. You know, you, uh, you spill something. You, you, you try to get it wiped up and cleaned up. You know, guys, when you go to dinner today and you get something on your tie, you're going to try to get that cleaned off before your wife sees it. We try to hide it. And that's what exactly Adam and Eve tried to do. They were covering their tracks. It sounds so much like us. And all of creation, get this, all of creation walked in obedience with God except for, for Satan and the fallen angels. And all of creation was looking on uh, to see, you know, what God was going to do. You know, they knew that God was all-powerful and omniscient. And, and in other words, he, he knew all things and, and, and He's in all places. And I thought, well, maybe God's going to strike them with a lightning bolt or something. But that didn't happen. And God didn't do this either. He didn't look at Adam and Eve and their sin and say, no worries. Don't worry about it. 
Because you've got to understand something. Ser- sin is serious business with God. You see, society couldn't hold itself together if every judge just dismissed everybody who ever did anything wrong and said, oh, it's okay because you're sorry. And the same is true with God's justice. All sin is serious because all sin's against God. When I sin, I may sin against myself. I may sin against my family. I may sin against my friends. I may sin against my acquaintances. But ultimately, my sin is against God. And so God made some shocking statements about Adam and Eve's sin. The very first thing that God said about their sin on this, on this epic journey was, from this day forward, the universe will be out of sorts because of you. The ground will not be as fertile. Childbearing will be difficult, Eve. Human relationships will be contemplated, uh, complicated with pride and with ego and with selfishness. And then God said a second thing. He said, because of your sinfulness, these are tough words, because you're guilty, because you've sinned against me, you will die. No longer will you live forever in these perfect bodies, in this perfect paradise. The price for a rebellion against God is, is insurmountable on our end. The price of sin is death and eternal separation from me, God says, in a place of utter torment and remorse and regret. But then the third thing that God says in, in, in His action is what absolutely blew Adam and Eve away. I think it took their breath away. In Genesis 3, 21, this is what God did. Now, if you're just reading through account of, the account of creation and the account of the fall of man, you might just glaze right over this. But the Lord made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. For garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. In other words, God had an ingenious arrangement designed to atone for the sin of man. He provided sinners with an alternative route for their, for their sin. Because of His holiness, He can't just gloss over sin and, and, and suspend the sentence. At the time, you know, He's tender and He's loving, and, and these two humans matter to Him. Adam and Eve, He loves them. He created them to have relationship with them. He created them to correspond with them. He created them to walk with Him. He loved them. They matter to Him. However, their sin had led them to lostness, and their lostness led God to do something. The thought that Adam and Eve could, uh, and their children, and their children's children, you know, having to atone for their sins forever and ever in hell, moved God to take upon Himself the responsibility of providing another way to atone. So check out what God does. He takes an animal. He takes an animal and he kills it right in front of Adam and Eve. He kills it right in front of them. You know, just imagine what they must have thought when they saw this animal die in front of them because this animal was an innocent third party. At this point, in the garden, in paradise, in the creation, there had never been such thing as death before. Imagine how they backed up at the first sight of first blood. Imagine how they, they sh- sh- shirked within themselves at the unnatural movements of that animal as God took that animal and He killed it on their behalf. They'd never seen blood before. It was right in front of their faces. And God skinned that animal and He took its skin and He covered their nakedness as if to say, in order for your sinfulness to be covered, in order for the wrongdoing to be atoned for, an innocent third party is going to have to absorb the penalty that's rightfully yours. Now keep in mind, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so we come upon what God wants with us. He wants us to be at one with Him. And I broke the word at one meant atonement into at one meant. It's another scenic overview. And God's epic journey. And what this is, is substitutionary atonement. It's an arrangement for an innocent third party to stand in the place of a guilty party and take on the penalty for their sin, thereby satisfying the demands of justice and allowing the guilty party to go free. 
And the act, what it does is it, it uh, restores and it reconciles the relationship between God and man. It's a simple, a simple way to remember atonement is at one man. By God's grace, through God's substitute, we're brought back into a relationship at one with God. And you know, some of you here, this is the very first time you've ever heard a Christian message. Or some of you, you know, you've been kind of checking out Christianity you know, to some degree. You may be looking at it as another world religion, or you may look at it as a great philosophy to think upon, or whatever else that may be. You're just kind of checking things out. But I can tell you this, you'll, you know... Um, you will never understand Christianity until you understand the concept of the substitutionary atonement. It's what separates Christianity from all other world religions. Everybody else is beating their way and climbing their way to get to heaven, but God in Christianity reaches down to us and He gives us a way to be lifted up. And, and it carves out the unique course of our faith and it satisfies the justice of God and it allows the guilty party to go free. And so here we're going through. We, we're talking, we, we've talked about you know first blood and, and now we're seeing at one month with God. And here is something else that we begin to see. We see a Passover lamb. In the book of Exodus, we've moved from Genesis to Exodus and, and we come to Exodus and God's people, the Israelites, they're in a terrible situation. They've been guilty of sin and they find themselves in the land of Egypt. They're, they're serving Pharaoh. They're making bricks all day and they're suffering. And many of their children have been put to death. And sin, there's plenty of sin to go around in Israel. And, and there's even more to go around among the Egyptians. And God's patience with sin is, is at a breaking point. And God says, you know, I'm bringing down judgment. And he says, I want my people to be let go. And Pharaoh just says, no, 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 no. And finally God gets to the place and he says, okay, this is my judgment that's coming, that's coming. The firstborn male of every household and every flock will die tonight. The death angel is going to sweep over. But God speaks and says, it doesn't have to be this way. If you don't want the firstborn dead tonight, what you've got to do is you've got to go out there into your flock and you've got to pick out a lamb, one that's spotless, one that's unblemished, one that's perfect, and you've got to sacrifice that lamb, you've got to cut its throat, you've got to take that blood, and you've got to paint it on the door, on the header, and on the doorpost. And sure enough, that night came, and the death angel came through. And when the death angel came through, you could hear the cries and you could hear the weeping. You could hear it all over Egypt as the firstborn of every household, every male child had died. And the firstborn male of the flocks had died. But get this, those who had the blood on their doorpost, the death angel passed over. It probably helped the explanation a little bit. When daddy had to go to the, to the flock and pick out the lamb, and that lamb happened to be Junior's favorite little lamb, and he didn't understand what his dad was doing, but on that resurrection morning, when life was still in their house, he came to fully understand. God provided another way. He provided another way of escape. There were those that dissed God. The Urban Dictionary says dissed means this. For those of you who are not familiar with the term, it means to be dismissed in politely. When God talked about that sacrifice, some said, what's up with that? Pfft, he doesn't really mean it. But God meant every word. And so those Israelites, they came to be set free. And as they were going out, we move into the book of Leviticus. And we come upon a Levitical system. Because in the book of Leviticus, it describes this sacrificial system. And, and we understand that when a person sinned deliberately, an animal sacrifice would be made, an innocent lamb would be slain, and only after the death of that lamb would the priest come to the guilty sinner and give the assurance that the sin had been paid for. And so under the Levitical system, think about this, tens of thousands of animals were being slain in every city, in every town, in every village. People knew that as they walked away from that dying animal, that an innocent third party had died in their place. And once a year, the sacrifices were made for sins for the entire nation. And the Hebrew word for this, for this uh, sacrifice, atone, 
Grab a hold of this. This is important. It means to cover. The Old Testament sacrifices could not actually, you know, remove sins. All they could do was cover them. And on the Day of Atonement, the people confessed their sins as a nation. And the high priest went into the Holy of Holies to make atonement for that sin. And in Leviticus chapter 16, it talks about Aaron, the high priest, having to spend hours and hours preparing himself to walk into the Holy of Holies before God. This was such an important thing. And God takes sin so seriously, and He takes repentance so seriously that on the four corners of Aaron's garment, the pomegranates were there so as to rattle. And the people would stand outside, and they'd listen to see if they could still hear the, the rattling, if they could still hear the movement, because they knew if they did that Aaron Aaron had been prepared to go in and present the sacrifice to God and that God had accepted it and not wiped him dead. And so Aaron would spend all that time in preparation. And on this day of atonement, he'd take two goats, which represented the two ways that God would deal with sin. And the first, he would take it and he would slice its throat, and his blood would pour out as a sacrifice to atone, to cover for sin. But then there was a second goat, and that goat would be led outside the camp some 12 miles and be set free. And that goat was called the scapegoat. Our, our sin was covered, and then the scapegoat represented it being taken away. So get this in your mind. In every camp and in every village, in every town, you could hear the shrieks of these animals as they died. And, and part of what God was doing was foreshadowing. He was giving us a scenic overview of that which was to come. And you move from the Levitical system and you get to the Old Testament prophets. And one of the most famous prophets was the prophet Isaiah. 800 years B.C. Um, he, he was. And in 800 B.C. Isaiah was out doing these crusades and he began to preach. And in Isaiah 53 verse 5 he says, But he, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. And the people, their heads began to spin. They were aware of, of the, the sacrificial system. They knew about the uh, tone and the cover. And they were new, uh, uh, aware of substitution. But now this is a new spin because it now sounded as if God was going to send a human as that third party to take on the significance of that sacrifice. And then the next prophet we come to is in the New Testament. His name is John the Baptist. And when Jesus walked up, I want you to get a picture of this. John sees Jesus coming. It's, this is a powerful thing to grab a hold of. He sees Jesus coming, and he declares in the, in, in the gospel, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the scapegoat too. He's not just the atoning sacrifice to cover, but he's the scapegoat. He takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. And, and John looked at the people and said, He's the one I've been talking about. He's the one who's the promised Messiah. He is the one who is coming. And then as we read through the New Testament, we come across something that divides history. It's the most recognized symbol in all the world, and it's called the cross. And when Jesus kicked off his teaching ministry at the, at the age of 30, this is what he declared. He said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The message translation puts it this way. This is what the Son of Man has done. He came not to serve, not to, not, he came to serve, not be served, and then to give away his life in exchange for many who are held hostage. Jesus said this about himself. He said, I have laid down my life for the sheep. There's a lot of significance that's going on right here. Jesus says, I've laid down my life for the sheep. 
Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And after living a sinless life, he was betrayed and he was arrested and he was caught falsely convicted and he was beaten and he was battered and he was bruised. A crown of thorns was placed upon his head and all of the heavenly saints had to be looking on with a, with a gasp in their breath thinking, Oh no, it is the Son of God. They knew what was coming next. They understood. They looked over the edge of eternity and they saw the Son of God taking that cross upon himself and heading up that Calvary road. The word Calvary means the place of the skull. It's a place of, of suffering. It's a place of death. And on that Friday, after they nailed those last nails into his hands and feet, and the sound of the hammer and the nails went silent. The universe is looking on. Lost sinners, the angels of glory, the fallen angels. And those through the hallways of faith who understood that God would do something great looked on. And Jesus is hanging there. And the Father turns his back on that sin and says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then this is what he cries out. These are the most beautiful words in all the Bible. It is finished it is finished man no more has to pay no more does man have to take a lamb and sacrifice it from his flock man no more has to to take that goat and, and make it the scapegoat because it is finished i have made the atonement for the sins of the world i have covered them i have covered them i have become the lamb i have become the sacrifice but yet that price seems too high. Guilty sinners, we're not, we're not worth it, are we? We don't deserve it, do we? But we got a substitute. We ought to atone for our own sins, but God loved us. We're the ones who thumbed our noses at God. We're the ones who dissed God. But God so loved the world. He so loved you and you and you and you and me that he gave his only begotten son that if you and you and you and you and me would only believe upon him, we would have eternal life. Isn't that amazing? That's what John 3.16 tells us. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing that God could love you that much? Isn't it amazing that anybody could love you that much, but God loves you just that much? And because God is just, and He doesn't just sweep away you know, our, our sin under the, the carpet of the universe, our sins deserve to be punished. The Bible says that, that the wages of sin is death. And that's what Jesus did. And he died. And the world went silent. The angels were quiet. They didn't even understand it. The world went silent. And the grave held him in the tight fist of death. And utter quietness. And then it came. The resurrection. The resurrection. And you know what the resurrection does? The resurrection is God's channel that gives us victory. And it assures us of eternal life in the presence of God. It secures our home in heaven. It reveals the righteousness of Christ in his life. And it's evidence of his perfect obedience unto the Father. The death of the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished something, you know, so full and so perfect that the resurrection was the, award, was the reward, His vindication, His glory. The grave could not hold Him. The Bible tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when this perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and when this mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written comes true, Death 
Get this. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up in victory. Therefore, as those who follow after the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't walk in death, we don't walk in defeat, we're not overcome, but we've been made more than overcomers through Him who loved us and gave His life for us and rose again. We live in victory. And Paul would go on and write to these these Corinthians and say this. Not only is death swallowed up in victory, he said, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? And then he says this a few verses later. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, as a believer, you're not beaten. As a believer, you're not downtrodden. As a believer, you've got hope. As one who follows after Jesus Christ, you live in victory. You're not having to strive to the victory. You're already there because you are in Him. Because when Jesus Christ came into your heart and came into your life, this great exchange took place. And we exchanged our guilt for His grace. And we exchanged our sin for His righteousness. And we exchanged our imperfection for all all of his perfections. And when God looks at you today, he doesn't see your stain of sin, but he sees that you have been atoned under the blood, covered with the blood of Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Now, if that don't light your fire, there's something wrong with your Bunsen burner. Now, I want to tell you one other, a couple, just a couple other things. If you don't have Christ today, here's your response. Man, you've been doing it your own way. This is our reaction. Oftentimes, we're walking along. We don't know anything's wrong, and suddenly it comes on the radar. Hey, I'm lost. So then we become lost, and we know it, but where our pride is not allowing us to do anything about it. Our ego's gotten in the way. If you keep going on that road, on that path, it's going to lead to your ultimate destruction, your ultimate separation from God, and your ultimate remorse, and your ultimate memories. Because I guarantee you in eternity, separated from God, you will remember every given opportunity that God's ever had for you to turn to Him and to trust Him as both Lord and Savior. You'll remember every word that was ever preached. You'll remember it better in hell than you will Five minutes after this worship service, you'll know it. Or you can take the road of his direction, the recommended route for the epic journey of following after Jesus Christ as both Lord and Savior. And so we have to ask ourselves a very sobering question Who am I going to trust? Because you know what? I let myself down sometimes. I know it's hard to believe, but we all do, don't we? You know, sometimes we make these promises to ourselves that we just don't keep. So am I really going to trust me? Or am I going to trust the one who's never let me down? Who's never let down his creation? So Jesus says, the epic journey that goes to the Father is a journey that follows me is the way the truth, and the life. And nobody gets there unless they go that way. Isn't that amazing? And when I look at that road that God has prepared all down through the pages from the Genesis all the way through the Gospels, this is what I see. That road's not covered in black asphalt as the blackness of my sin. But it's a road that's covered in the precious blood of Jesus Christ who covers my sin and the Lamb of God who not only covers it but He takes my sin away. Awesome stuff. He takes it away. This morning I want to ask you would you place your hope in Jesus Christ? Would you simply say this morning, Lord Jesus, I trust you. Let's bow our heads right now. Right now, you're lost. If it's come on your radar, you're lost. 
There's something telling you, man, don't listen to this preacher. It's going to embarrass you. But you know, I know very few people that would ever get embarrassed at the applause of heaven in their hearts and lives who respond to Jesus Christ. I know of no one, as a matter of fact. And right now, God's given you an opportunity. And you can pray a prayer that's simple. It's not a formula prayer. It's not one way or another that you've got to pray it. But you can say something like, God, I don't even know how to pray. But as best I know how, I've recognized how lost I am. And I want your direction in my life. I've sinned, and my sin needs to be covered. And it needs to be taken away. So as best I know how, Lord Jesus, I come to you. And I ask you to come in to live in me. And be both my Savior and be my Lord. Now, if you prayed that prayer, the Bible gives you a promise, if you really meant it, that you're saved right now. Right now, you have become a part of God's people called the church. Isn't that awesome? He's a Savior. He's beyond our compare. And this morning, I'm going to pray a a word here in just a second. And the piano's going to play. And if you've made that decision to follow after Jesus, I want to encourage you to do something. To step out and make your way to the front. We've got a team of encouragers here that want to give you some stuff to help you along the way in following after Jesus. We won't embarrass you. Some of you will feel led to maybe become a part of this church family. You come as well. And then we're going to wrap up our church service this morning with all of us singing a glorious song to a glorious Savior. Heavenly Father, right now, help us in this moment of decision to make decisions that give us the epic destination of the presence of you, the Father, through Jesus Christ, the Son. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's stand. You come right now. We're not going to sing. People are prayerfully standing beside you. We're going to give you a moment You've responded to Christ this morning. You've asked Him to be your Lord. You feel something different. He calls us to step out for Him. Would you come? Right now. We're not going to tarry. Others of you called to be a part of the church family. You come right now. I'm looking for the movement in the room and I know in a crowd this size that not everybody knows Christ. And I pray for those of you that don't and not making the decision that you'll be given another opportunity. This week I've had two friends go on into eternity. One friend would be 89 years old if she'd made it a couple more days. Dee Dee Harvey, a longtime part of our church family that moved to Columbus, her and Bob, a few years back. God took her home. Another friend, he's my age. I got a an emergency prayer request on Thursday said pray for Gerald he's had a heart attack and it doesn't look good a few minutes later came Gerald's received his ultimate healing he's now in heaven and I'm thinking man he's too young he's been a pastor he pastored in this area he's pastors in Virginia but he received his ultimate healing it could happen to any one of us on any day Friday, an 18-year-old kid in our local area got killed on Highway 98. So there's no distinction between young and old that affects us all. I pray that you'll be given another opportunity before the death angel passes over. It's that important. I dreamed last night that I fell on my knees before the Lord Jesus Christ on a green and wet grass and soggy ground and I begged God for somebody's soul I don't know who it was it may be you I pray that it is you and that you'll know him today as a church let's sing to our glorious Savior as you go out let me remind you're not going out yet we're going to sing but after we dismiss Pick up a JC sticker at the desk on the hallway walls and advertise Jesus on your car. You don't have to advertise Destin or 
you know, Honolulu or something like that. Let's advertise Jesus. Let's advertise the heavenly city. You can sign up for the resurrection run. We've got over 150 runners right now. Last service, I said we're about $3,200 short on uh, sponsorship. Man came and gave me a check a while ago for $1,600. So God may, you know, speak to one of y'all to help write out the rest of that sponsorship for our discipleship and missions ministry here at Village as we go around the world to share the gospel of Christ. But right now, we're going to sing a song about a glorious Savior. And folks, I would pray that song would bring us to our knees and around the altar to worship the King of glory and that we would be prepared that this could be the day. As you exit the property today, God bless you. As you turn left and turn right and go up and down the highway, or maybe this be the day, may this be the day that instead of turning left or right, we go up. Amen? Let's sing the song. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim, hallelujah, what a Savior, bearing shame and scoffing. With his blood, hallelujah, what a Savior, hallelujah, 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 what a
He is alive. Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. 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 Wow.